Hello and welcome to On the Outside, the podcast that shares diverse views on outdoors news. On the Outside is taking a rest, but in the meantime, I'm excited to share an episode from another podcast, I Think You'll Like. Third Waves is one of the outputs of Third Magazine, a platform that amplifies marginalised voices through print, events and on the airwaves with their podcast. The show explores the intersections of culture and activism and brings their listeners interviews and discussions with guests who have knowledge and lived experiences on the topics they talk about. The type of things they've covered in the past have included toxic masculinity, cancel culture, cultural appropriation and more. But the episode I'm sharing with you today is all about ethical tourism. I think this is going to be of interest to on the outside listeners, but because we are focused on the UK, it's a topic we wouldn't necessarily cover ourselves. And as the world starts opening up again, many of us are planning holidays and travelling further afield for the first time in a while. So I thought it was a great time to share this. This episode was first released in July 2020 and the hosts, Daniela, Rona and Tribe, explore things like how communities are affected by tourism and what a more conscious approach to travelling might look like. And then Daniela speaks to Tom Selwyn, who is a professorial research associate at the Department of Anthropology and Sociology at the London Middle East Institute. He is widely published in the field of anthropology, of tourism and pilgrimage, which for those of you who know my origin story is of great interest to me. And he also founded the MA in Anthropology of Tourism, Travel and Pilgrimage at SOAS in 2010. Without further ado, I hope you enjoy and find value in this episode from Third Waves. Hello and welcome to Third Waves. Third is an intersectional publication celebrating culture, heritage and diversity. And on Third Waves, we will do the same. I am Rona, stylist, creative director and founder of Third. I'm Daniela. I'm a writer, musician and producer at Third. And I'm Tribe, DJ, radio host and music editor at Third. Okay, so um, should we kick off by just discussing maybe the idea of tourism itself? For me, something that's very interesting to think about is like, why do people travel? And I feel like one of the reasons why people do it is to kind of go outside of your own comfort zone, um, be challenged by new viewpoints and hopefully come back with, um, I don't know, a broadened scope of your understanding of the world, right? Yeah, yeah. but what's also interesting here is that you always leave your footprint in one way or the other. So it's not like um, it's something that you can just do and think you haven't touched on other people's lives, etc. cetera. Um, what do you guys think about tourism as a kind of a general concept? Yeah, I feel like there's many positives to going traveling and being a tourist. Um, as you mentioned, traveling allows you to see more of the world and and get yourself out of your bubble so you know that there's more out there. Because it's very sim- it's very easy to be, um, I guess, so grounded in the idea of your home and what, let's say, London is to us, that you forget that there's different ways of doing things, there's different ways of being. Um, so travelling allows you to experience that, even if it's just briefly, even if it's just surface, it's just the opportunity to get yourself out there and, and connect with different cultures and people. What do you think? I mean, I'm a busybody. So one of the best ways I get to take a break is when I travel somewhere else, just because I have no commitments. You know, you just lose your sense of like... Having to be places. Yeah, Mm. exactly. So for me, relaxation and um, 
disconnection almost to a certain extent and allowing yourself to be around something which is quite unknown is a a pro to traveling Mm. yeah i think it's quite quite interesting that you two kind of touched on the different aspects of like why people travel or people's different interactions you know it it might be like just switching off and being somewhere and being immersed in that or it might be like going with the explicit intent of you know finding something new um but i'd love to just maybe get into a bit of like personal stories about like your travel experiences where you've been i mean we've all been very lucky to travel um around the world actually do you know what? I have been very fortunate. I, I've been tra- I've travelled quite a few places, such as like I did like uh, coast to coast of South America, um, and I also worked on a cruise ship for a while for wow. PNO Australia. So I, I did definitely get to see quite a few places in the South Pacific and Australia and Southeast Asia. Uh, one of the things that kind of stood out to me, <laughs> it's a bit messed up when you think about it, is. Um, we would land on these islands in the South Pacific and um, we'll be there with our cameras or, you know, with all the kind of eagerness of like, oh, you know, this is a, a new place. And these are small remote islands that have their own distinct communities um, and I guess have a couple of like boats or ships that would land um, every couple of weeks. So they would just casually be, the, the sh- kids there would be casually learning outside. They'll have like outside classrooms. And um, we would just walk past their like their lessons, uh, taking pictures, like especially because they looked very distinctive with their, they, some of them had blonde hair, as you've seen in pictures and stuff like that. And people would be there with their camera just intruding on these personal moments of you know learning in a in a uh, educational space uh, another moment that stood out was when um one of the islands we landed on had a i guess a, a reputation for a colonial reputation for being an island where the people used to cannibalize uh people or p- invaders of their island so part of what they've created as a, a touristy aspect of a, um of their island is that people could could go over to a, a fake pot or cauldron and stand there while the um one of the islanders would pretend to be cutting off your throat and cook you and uh you would see people tourists taking pictures of their like husband or their children while this was happening um as if it's a a kind of touristy experience that you can all participate in which was uh I, i felt it was quite um it didn't fit well with my spirit, as people say. So I didn't, you know, there was a lot of moments where I found myself stepping away from being a tourist and, and deciding I don't want to participate in this. I think mm. what's really fascinating about those two sort of moments is that one is like where uh, the local community um, are engaging in what they do on a day-to-day basis. So these kids are going to school, which happen to be on, on a beach, and you guys happen to walk past and decide, oh, don't they look interesting? Let me take a picture of them with total disregard of what was happening in that moment and what that interaction might do, like, on a basic level, distract these kids from their lesson, right? Um, and then the other example is where uh, the local uh people have seen that there's a commercial uh, benefit to staging something that is off uh, an ancient custom or whatever um, and then benefiting off that and actually both of these examples are are very uncomfortable for different reasons Mm. yeah Mm. definitely it's true because uh, I guess like you mentioned uh, on one side some people might be taking agency over their um their tourism and how they are perceived and how they want to um, capitalise on it. Whilst the other, it's, I guess, to a certain extent, they've agreed to have um, cruise ships land on their island. um, But these children do not have necessarily agency to have their lessons intruded upon like that. Yeah, that's that's a good point. It's like people making decisions for people. Exactly. Um, and, And you've also been to South America, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, South America was cool. Uh, I really uh, enjoyed. Um, so I went to Brazil, Argentina. Um, I traveled quite a bit around Brazil and then Peru. Um, and I, I, one of the things that I picked up on as I was traveling was that there's two ways I felt. And, you know, any, anyone can weigh in on this. There's two ways to travel. Um, you could travel by 
being an active tourist uh, by staying in the holiday resorts um, and doing the organized trips uh, that your, let's say your hotel or your hostel or whatever organized for you and then interacting mainly with other tourists whilst the, on the other hand you've got uh, people who I guess make the effort to kind of integrate in the community so those are the people that try and pick up the language those people are the people that are um, maybe living or staying with the people in the community and um, maybe trying to learn a bit more about the culture both both are valid in the sense of because like we were saying there's different ways to travel but um it it's very obvious when you are traveling that sometimes you come out of it and you've only interacted with, let's say, other Europeans because that's who you've been, I guess, going on these trips with and um, sharing hotel spaces with. Whilst on the other hand, there's a, uh, people who actually have gained something from actually being in the community. Um, no way is wrong. It's just a difference. Yeah. Um, and Rona, how about you? Is there a travel that you you particularly remember about? I would say I kind of discovered, like, my like passion for traveling maybe when I went to Vietnam okay. um, so I was out there for like six weeks which for me is quite a long period like time period of time to be somewhere on holiday um, and one of the things I did notice about being in Vietnam and the way I was holidaying there compared to some uh, other people I was with was um, sometimes in Vietnam, obviously, because of the Vietnam War, there has become like this whole commercialization of, say, like the caves where the Viet Cong used to use to, you know, hide and battle from the US and etc. Um, they have become quite commercialized spaces and, and spaces that people like to visit. You can go and you can spend money on like getting a ticket and um, viewing those. Um, and for me, like that was just not not something that I personally felt like moved to do. I didn't personally feel moved to go and like see these spaces because I felt quite uncomfortable in these spaces, to be very honest with you. Um, and it didn't quite make sense to me why I'd go to a place of war with like a tiny bit of like historical context and understanding of it. I don't I didn't quite understand what I'd be doing there. So though I understood that you know, obviously the Vietnamese, the, the war in Vietnam is like a massively important uh, historical event that happened in the country. Um, I just felt uncomfortable with the idea of like basically going through the caves myself and pretending I was like a Viet Cong person. It just wasn't really something I wanted to do. Yeah. I, um, I, well, I suppose... Um the thing I wanted to say was that I can totally understand why that felt really uncomfortable and I, I feel like I would feel the same. Um, and yet I'm also thinking, you know, if you if you visit a place like Vietnam and don't acknowledge um, the Vietnam War and, and kind of engage with that on some level, that would be also kind of weird. Um, it's just it's just, yeah, totally like what you're what you're saying, the kind of presentation that you've encountered there just feels yeah, if it makes you feel uncomfortable, that's that's just not. That's yeah, not I think right, is it? I think the difference for me, like I remember one of the first things I did do when I went to Vietnam is I went to they have like they had quite a new museum that was built, and in the museum you can learn a lot about the Vietnamese War. So I, it wasn't like I was just like saying like I'm not interested in this aspect of the history. It was just more like I didn't understand like why going to certain certain places yeah. and like going through the caves. I don't know. For me personally, that felt like a bit a bit weird and I didn't really get a strong explanation from anyone else who was going um, that persuaded me to go mm. or made it made me feel like more comfortable with going so and that was just something I chose to opt, to opt out of. I think it's quite interesting because um, through tourism I guess there's a level of reflection of how a country wants their culture and their history to be seen and observed by their tourists. Also, just using Vietnam as another example, another instance has come to my mind, which um, I actually did participate on this one. I can't remember exactly where it was. I think it was in, like, someone's palace. But um, basically, they had a body that was embalmed, oh, wow, like yeah. of an emperor. Yeah. Um, and, like, you, you kind of went on a tour, and it 
finish at like this emperor's like <laughs> body, basically. Um, and I think I went because I was like, oh my gosh, like you know, the architecture of those buildings, it's it's just amazing. Do you know what I mean? And the history is definitely something I'd like to like like know and understand especially if you're going to be in another culture know and understand um but then I do remember waiting a very long time to see this body and then when I was in the queue and I'd finally seen what do you know what I mean mm. walk past the embalmed body I remember thinking like damn like that that body's been like that for like two like what was it like a few hundred at least yeah. years and I kind of felt sorry for it yeah. I can't lie I kind of felt like Give it yeah. a rest. Like, yeah. <laughs> give it a rest. No, honestly, God, I, <laughs> it was kind of a bit like we're all just walking past. Yeah. And, yeah, I know, you know what you mean. It reminds me of the. Um, this is a bit of a side point, but uh, in the in the museum, uh, what's it called? The Royal Institute of Physicians in London. You know, okay. Where yeah. All the old surgeries of, and stuff like yeah, all that. There is the um, the skeleton of like the tallest man or something, and next to the skeleton, there's a little placard which is basically the will of this guy <laughs> because throughout his life he was basically toured and showcased as the tallest man. I don't know if he's literally the tallest man ever, but very tall man. Um, and on and in his will, he basically said, "When I die, please oh, not no. let my body be displayed for people to see." <laughs> Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and yet that's, oh, that's, that's what's happened to the skeleton. So yeah, it's a bit of a side point. Yeah. But I guess that, that kind of ties in a bit to the the voyeuristic aspect of just mm. wanting to see things and then the disregard of the agency, as you were saying before, Tribe, um, of what people in the situation, even if it was in the past, what they might have wanted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Tying that in, it kind of reminds me with, um, and tying into what I was saying before as well, about uh, the favelas. Uh, I know that they have some in Argentina and they have it in Brazil. Um, and I'm sure, I don't know, in Cape Town, they have uh, some stuff as well in South Africa. And it's become a marker of the culture, if you know what I mean. If you think about cause, uh, Brazilian culture, how um, Bali Funk has uh, arisen from there and how um, it's supposed to be very, I guess, vibrant places. But these are places that have arisen out of a lot of segregation, a lot of poverty. Um, some of it, you know, from the government's, I guess, policies that they've had over centuries. But yet it's become such a kind of touristic hotspot if you know what I mean. So when I was there, there were you can sign up for tours or you can sign up for Bali Funk parties in the favelas. So you will be going to these places where people live and experiencing. They've even opened up post, um, hotels there. If you know what I mean, it's quite interesting. But again, it, like I said before, it comes down to the agency. How much agency do people have over their homes or their their environment being turned into touristic spaces? Um, especially if it's arisen out of a lot of, I guess, uh, positives um, and also negative uh, experiences. Yeah, I, I, I guess the word that keeps coming to my mind is opportunism. And I, this is a word that we, we talk about all the time, you know, whether it's on Third Magazine or in our events or wherever. Like, it's, it's um, you know, as you were saying, Rona, of this tour that you went on, it was obviously a really... There was, there was an opportunity there to learn something about history, and that's why you wanted to go. And, and yet it was seized up as an opportunism moment by some people and maybe that one was a good example and there's bad examples but for me like I feel like that word is a really important kind of uh, context around all of this discussion hmm. yeah and uh, another interesting aspect of tourism is like I said the way that we are perceived um it gives us the opportunity to look at the way we look at ourselves as a country. So one of the things that I found quite interesting talking to Canadians and people from the US is that when they go to the UK, they don't just go to the UK, they go to the whole of Europe and UK is one of the stops in their trip. Like it's um, to them, we are part of the European experience as much as we possibly especially with Brexit don't see ourselves as much as uh you know especially with the I guess we we're in an island but um to them we are kind of part of that and our histories so much welded into that as well so it, it's interesting the way that we're perceived and the way that we perceive ourselves um there's a bit of a sometimes a, a difference yeah true
Okay, so um, we want, always want to kind of have some uh, context around our discussions and oftentimes starting with definitions or facts and figures. So we've kind of collated some um, information and definitions around uh, topics around tourism. Tribe, would you mind starting us off with the, just the definition of what tourism is? Sure thing. I'm sure you've heard most of these like phrases being thrown around, but not actually know how to kind of pin it down or how it fits into what we're all talking about. I'm going to start with tourism. The definition of tourism is the commercial organisation and operation of holidays and visits to places of interest. Um, so I went on uh, the UN website, uh -huh. not often that I do that. Um, but yeah, so I went into U United Nations World Tourism Organization website. There's a quote here, which is, today the business volume of tourism equals or even surpasses that of oil experts, food products and automobiles. That That's is crazy. crazy. Hmm. Um, it's, it's a big big old industry um and the other thing that was interesting on the website was i came across this infographic where they kind of uh listed out the the kind of different reasons why tourism matters and so i'm just going to read a couple of these out but basically to me a lot of these um points are like double-edged swords so for example one of them is cultural pre pre cultural preservation uh one is environmental protection um, one is jobs, that makes sense. One in ten jobs um, in the world is is related to tourism. Wow. Economic growth, that again kind of ties in, that makes sense. Uh, apparently, the, the figure here from 2018 is that 1.6 trillion US dollars in exports are related to tourism. Damn. Um, and, and it makes up 10% of world, the world's GDP um, and 7% of the world's exports uh yeah the things that really stood out to me but probably the points about cultural preservation and, and environmental protection because i can see how tourism can um in, through encouraging people to engage with history yeah. and engage with animals yeah make you aware of these issues and, and people start i guess donating money to charity or whatever like different ways of kind of putting a positive on that um we know that tourism for sure damages these things directly um so yeah they kind of feel like double-edged sword to me should we talk about adventure tourism then? yeah so adventure tourism is a type of tourism involving travel to remote or exotic locations in order to take part in physical challenge and outdoor activities so you find that with people who like to go surfing and like go to remote places in peru and places like that to get good waves or you get you find that with like rock climbing and um what's those like bungee jumping and um, extreme kind of activities uh, that you wouldn't necessarily get in, let's say, the UK. Yeah. Um, this year has been an especially bad year for um, people who go to Mount Everest. Um, 11 climbers died yeah. in 16 days. Um, and uh, first of all, I want to just recommend a really amazing book um, by John Krakauer called Into Thin Air. It's very well written and gives a very kind of comprehensive overview of what some of these issues around climbing Mount Everest are. But there are many things that contribute to these deaths. Um, and one of them is overcrowding on people trying to reach the peak. I think there was a figure of something like 800 climbers were trying to, to get to the peak and back wow. within this kind of weather window that was just completely impossible. So people were getting stuck, getting overexposed in that kind of altitude. Um, and also, like, I've, there are many climbers who go there because um, they can afford to pay mm. for a tour of that kind, but yet they might not be um, experienced enough or in the physical condition to actually take on that type of challenge. But then uh, the tour is like the company who organized the tour um, feel like they've paid all this money, so I should help them get there. And then there's this weird pressure going on where like people don't feel like they can back out. And that can be just actually deadly. Um, and the other thing for me that oftentimes is forgotten in all these stories is that um, of like something like 200 body count in the history of people climbing uh, Mount Everest, uh, a huge number of that are the Sherpas, mm. uh, people from the local community who take on this very dangerous job because it's very good money and find it hard to back out of it. Um, and yet, would they be putting themselves in that position if it wasn't because there was uh, a kind of really lucrative job opportunity there? I don't think so. 
Um, this kind of ties into the whole thing about um, tourism being an opportunity for uh, a lot of people who, um, let's say, sometimes there's not much opportunities in their country, but at the same time, to what risk, you know? I think also it kind of neatly like leads into the idea of uh, environmental issues. Yeah. That can be, you know, sort of intensified by tourism. Obviously, waste and plastic is an international issue, but Venice at the moment are particularly struggling. Um, the sort of sanitation workers in, in Venice have quite strict instructions regarding um, dispensing of the waste. Mm. They can't really keep up with how much has been deposited into the bins. We have this very small place which is being flooded with lots of lots of tourists, basically. But on top of that, there is this sort of double standard that is existing in Venice at the moment where sort of there are very strict guidelines and fines being administered to locals when it comes to how much waste they produce and how they're getting rid of their stuff. But these same fines do not apply to the tourists. You know, there were loads of protests about this and some hotels like the Nova Cento Hotel and the Hotel Flora have sort of taken action and are trying to like reduce the amount of waste by stopping, you know, using plastic bottles and that sort of stuff. That's um, quite powerful, isn't it? Because what you're talking about there is like a grassroots mm. action against something that isn't right. They, they're having all kinds of issues, right? So another problem is... I guess you could call it a gentrification situation where um, a majority of the houses I've, I've heard of flats um, on Venice Island itself um, are not owned by locals. Um, and and that's a real problem as well, isn't it? Yeah, I th- currently at the moment, like some hosts for Airbnb in the city have like 135 listings. What? So 135 home listings, you know, which they're reaping cash off oh, out of <laughs> which is great for some um but also in terms of like actual rentals since 2015 that's tripled from 2441 to now 8320 airbnb which, which is a massive increase mm. the only good thing is that in well this month actually uh, fair bnb has now launched which is a non-for-profit home sharing site that now allows, um, well, now only permits residents um, to be hosts. Oh, wow. And it limits you to one home. Yeah, that's um, a big difference. And also takes like a 15% cut, which is then put back into the community. Yeah. Um, or put into social projects back into Venice. So That's really that cool. That's the a good step I forward. Go mm. sure Have you been before? Yeah, yeah so how's I went like? to Venice um, and one of my best friends lives in Venice, she lives on the island and one of the first things that she said to me um, was like, you know, people who live on the island, there's like very few of us who are mm. actually locals, like a very small percentage wow. um, is majority tourists and and there's a huge gentrification problem mm. and we feel like we are like the last stand. That's that so we crazy. That we are really just trying to fight against that and the rent is, is extremely expensive on the island and so you can definitely feel that tourism with is, mm. is a massive engine I mean, we don't really have time to get into it right now, but talking of engines, there's the whole uh, cruise ship problem uh, in Venice. But yeah, I would oh, just yeah. say that that's something to look into. Hello, Tony. Hi, Tom. Hi. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for talking to us um, about tourism today. Um, so, Tom, you've, you've worked a very long time in this uh, complex field of anthropology and tourism. Um, is there anything that you're specifically focused on at the moment? Um, yeah, well, I'm actually writing a, a chapter uh, about why people travel. Um, that's, um, they're going to be published fairly soon. So that's what I'm working on at the moment. Uh, I've just finished a, a, a long uh, chapter about Brexit. But oh, wow. um, there is there are all sorts of relations between Brexit and uh, travel. Uh, but I, I the, the specific thing that I'm working on at the moment is this question about why people travel, and I, I, de- I dedicate it to um, Alan Kurdi, who is, was a three-year-old boy who died on his way um, from Syria to the West. 
because he was bombed out of Syria. And uh, I think that the field of tourism and pilgrimage, by the way, so it's tourism, pilgrimage, and the cultural industries uh, must include people who are forced to travel rather than those who just choose to travel. So I think that we need to talk about refugees as well. And you can see this in all sorts of ways. Uh, I published a book on tourism, uh, not so long, well, I published several, but one of the, in one of them there is a very interesting chapter about a hotel um, in, in Greece uh, that in the summer is for tourists and in the winter is for refugees. So they do indeed cross, and the Mediterranean region is um, possibly the region in the world where they cross most obviously. What I find interesting is that um, your your work covers um, different types of travel, tourism being um, one of them, because one mm-hmm. of the things that we were discussing about tourism is that um, people, from a tourist perspective, people's desire to go places are, are, are complicated, so... Um, there are different motivations and different things that people seek out when they go yeah. places. Um, mm-hmm. And so when, when you use the word tourism or travel, um, it actually covers a whole range of behaviors. It does. Um, it's interesting that your work is, is actually so much broader than that as well. Yes, I think actually travel is, uh, it's important to include travel. So we're talking about travel, tourism, and pilgrimage. And if you go back um, into historical accounts of travel, um, <clears throat> particularly, for example, to my favorite medieval traveler, Ibn Battuta, who was Moroccan, a um, very famous uh, Moroccan traveler. He, he, he went for about uh, 25 years or so all around the Muslim world and beyond. And uh, he originally went because he wanted to make a pilgrimage to Mecca. But in fact, he was very keen on looking at uh, cities and buildings and listening to intellectuals and to debating all sorts of things along the way. So it was a very rich experience that he had in those long years of travel. And he even spent, because he had to earn a bit of money to keep going, he spent quite a long time as a judge in Delhi. And his travels uh, kind of opened up the whole field in quite a good way. Basically, what he said and what other people have said um, more recently is that travel and tourism are about a combination of education and experience. He was one of those famous um, Arab travelers. There were several of them, Um, but he he was the most famous. And he's written about by uh, Tim McIntosh Smith, Mm. who's written several books about him. Um, And he's an archetypal traveller from whom we can learn a great deal about the nature of travel and tourism and pilgrimage. So could we go to this um, this uh, Israel-Palestine um, area? Um, mm. A lot of your work is, is focused on that. Um, I'm, I'm not really um, expert in that, in that area, but, um, but one thing that I wanted to ask you about was this idea that uh, what what Israel is to a lot of Jewish people around the world, where they uh, where it's sort of considered a kind of homeland, um, mm-hmm. and I've always been fascinated by the idea that Jewish people from a, from other places who live in other places go to Israel to visit and and see it as a kind of returning home in in, in a way, and yet of course that's not their place of actual residence, and mm. they, their kind of influx into that area with certain feelings of entitlement um, can have huge um, impact on the local community? Yeah, okay. Well, I suppose the first thing to say is um, not specifically about Israel-Palestine. I'll come to that in a second. But the first thing to say is that many people in the world, and possibly most people in our world, have a conception of more than one home. I mean, if you think about the huge number of migrants, it's not just the 71 million refugees, but there's many more than that who who move around the world um, for jobs, because they want to, because of all sorts of reasons. That doesn't mean to say that they give up the idea of their previous home or their previous homes in plural. And most of us have an idea of... uh, uh, the place that maybe we were born and we have uh, feelings towards that and feelings towards the place we live in at the moment and uh, feelings towards the place we might go in the future or something like that. So the idea of people having an idea of one home 
is not, in my view, particularly realistic. I think that people have ideas of more than one. And if you think of all the communities that we have in this country, uh, Britain, um, from the uh, from the uh, Afro-Caribbean region, from South Asia, or whatever it is, I mean, the evidence every day is that uh, people who come from these areas certainly have a conception of the historical area which their family is connected to. They have a feeling for that, but they have a very strong feeling for the place that they live in at the moment, namely Britain. So here's an example of uh, people with ideas of more than one home. So it, doesn't, it shouldn't surprise us, I think, that uh, people can, can have these, uh, these um, ideas. Coming to Israel and Palestine, um, it is certainly true that um, many Jewish people in the world um, regard Israel um, as uh, a, a homeland or some kind of homeland. Some, some Jewish people uh, make Aliyah to Israel and go and live there and um, in a sense I suppose feel that they are living out their um, their life in what they regard as their homeland. Other people, other Jewish people visit Israel and feel that they've um, visited a place which is in a sense their biblical homeland and so on. Um, and uh, and some people, there are some Jewish people who who say, well, it's not. Uh, our our home is in London or New York or wherever, and Israel is Israel and uh, so on. Um, but we don't want to necessarily think of Israel as our home. Now, as far as my kind of work on tourism is concerned. What I would say is that um, I think that it's fine uh, to feel that your home is uh, there in Israel. I mean, this, uh, that, that's fine. What is not fine is if you then extend it and you make the populations who were there before, um, if you occupy them, if you make life very difficult for them, if there is a great sense, there is a huge inequality between uh, contemporary Israelis and Palestinians. Um, and that is uh, unacceptable. And it doesn't follow from um, the idea that Israel is a homeland for the Jewish people. You can have a homeland and you can, you can, you can be there, but that does not imply that you have to uh, occupy and oppress uh, somebody else who also regard it, regards it as their home. And I think that the scholars presently working on tourism in the area would say that uh, it would be a very good thing if um, these kind of issues were explained to tourists and pilgrims as they come, um, and that uh, really the task of the tourism industry in that area is to try and uh, speak something about the uh, the truth of the history uh, of the area, the truth of the um, society and culture of Palestinians as well as uh, Israelis, and work towards a situation where there is complete freedom of movement between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River. Um, and instead, what you get is you get a lot of tourist guides, particularly uh, Israeli tourist guides, who are talking to pilgrims and tourists who are coming there as if the uh, uh, the region was more or less the same as the conception of what the biblical region was. Uh, this is obviously uh, completely unrealistic. It ignores the local people um, and is uh, not really uh, at all um, sensible historically. I mean, obviously, it isn't a biblical area. We've moved on. We're in the 21st century and so on. So all of these complicated um, issues need to be talked about with honesty and with truthfulness rather than giving uh, uh, tourists from the West or the uh, global North uh, some kind of idea that this is, in fact, a biblical region. In fact, it's a region for all three religions, uh, and indeed, more than that, it's not just Jews, Christians, and Muslims who live there, but also there's a strong Hindu co community also, and an African community, and so on. It's a multicultural, multi-religious area, and it should be talked about to pilgrims and tourists 
uh, in those kind of terms. Um, would you be able to speak to the idea of privilege in, in a more general sense? For me, I feel like uh, tourism is an inherent, inherently privileged pursuit. Um, and with that, there are, there are lots of tensions and issues that come with it. Mm -hmm. You could say that tourists in general are privileged um, or, te or tend to be uh, privileged. But then if you think about it, uh, that's not necessarily true. Um, um, I mean, lots of people will go on holiday um, who don't have a great deal of money, um, but then they take a reasonable uh, you know, package tour or charter tourist uh, offer, go to go to a tourist resort in, in the Balearic Islands, for example, go to Mallorca, go to Magaluf. Uh, I, I, I don't think one can necessarily call them privileged. Um, uh, uh, and, and the other thing is that provided the local tourism organization in the resorts that they go to, whether these resorts are in, in Mallorca or, or uh, uh, Greece or, or Cyprus or wherever, if the local organizers, the, lo the local government of the area concerned, are really careful about, um, yes, looking after the tourists, but yes, also, um, possibly primarily, looking after the local people uh, by ensuring that uh, taxes are used in sensible ways, uh, that buildings are not obstructive to local people, that local services are um, shared, um, and uh, perhaps local people have privileges over access to those local services, then the tourists are not so necessarily privileged. Uh, I think there are all sorts of cases in the world where they are privileged, um, and particularly, possibly in the global south, and that's very unfortunate. Um, and, uh, if, and that results in the same kind of inequalities uh, and so on that we were talking about earlier in relation to Israel and Palestine. If we move back then to Israel-Palestine, it seems to me that in many ways, uh, uh, tourists and pilgrims <clears throat> to the Middle East uh, are uh, uh, privileged in the sense that certainly um, Jewish tourists are privileged in the sense that they are uh, regarded as being um, uh, people often with kinship links to the area and who don't have any kind of much responsibility, shall we say, uh, towards um, Palestinian residents. Um, their concern is more or less exclusively with the Israeli population, not the Palestinian population. And I think that is unfortunate. It's also very unfortunate that, that um, evangelical Christians, for example, um, tend to come to the region and tend to tell the organizations looking after tourism in the region, and actually tell tourist guides what they want to hear. What they want to hear is some version of history which privilege, privileges the biblical period more than anything else, celebrates things like King David and all that kind of thing, and completely ignores um, the existence of uh, a, a large part of the population of region, which is um, uh, the Palestinian uh, community or the Muslim community or whatever. And in that sense, there is, or there is, a, there is a very unfair sense of privilege um, uh, with those two particular types of tourists or others too. But, so in a nutshell, what I'm saying is that it doesn't necessarily have to be the case that all tourists are privileged over the regions into which they go, but it does sometimes happen. I'll give you a couple of examples. I suppose what's interesting that's coming up here is that um, a real danger of tourism of any kind, really, in regards to uh, any region or whether it has, has to do with an area of, of turbulence, um, is that it's very, very easy for a hegemonic um, story to take over. Um, yes. And it's quite dangerous in, in that sense, I suppose. Yes, I think, I think you're right, actually. Uh, a friend of mine has written a book about La Réunion, which is an um, island which is uh, part of France. Um, and uh, the point that he makes is that this is a very beautiful island with mountains and lots of uh, trees and plants and so on. 
Um, and the whole of the effort of the government is to make it as uh, garden-like as possible. And the reason for that is that people from the metropolitan uh, areas of France um, look at the island and go to the island <clears throat> as if it was some kind of garden that they uh, um, control, if you like. And it's, the, it's an example of, uh, I don't know, the, the rational, developed, um, rich world looking at the less developed, poor world, which is full of all sorts of natural things um, and and uh, and then, you know, sitting in sitting in the hotels and so on. And what is ignored completely are the working conditions of those people working on the coral reefs in the sea or on the, in the trees or the uh, parks of the country. Um, and so any sort of critical understanding of the social and political and economic structure of the island is ignored. What is presented above all is this beautiful garden-like place uh, that is basically for our uh, enjoyment. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I visited Reunion Island a few years ago and it was an amazing experience, but even whilst I was there, it's very present, this sense that you're in a very um, manicured space. Yeah. I mean, when you go hiking in, in Mafat, you, you feel like you are somehow in the Alps just, just by the kind of uh, the way that it's, it's managed. And, yeah. and it's hard to shake the weirdness of that, I would say. Absolutely. And I think that uh, I think your phrase, manicured place, is a very good one. And it does apply to the Alps as well. It does apply to the Himalayas. It applies to all sorts of places where uh, people from um, of the West or the global North go and more or less do what they want and uh, the economies are subservient to their needs of climbing the ice mountain or, you know, going to the most beautiful uh, um, landscape imaginable. But the actual conditions under which that takes place are not really the subject of their, um, of their, of their journeys. Um, so it, it is a sort of way in which the global north imposes its own agenda on the global south. I think you're right. Mm. What would what would be um, an advice that you might give around the, how to travel more ethically? First of all, I wouldn't necessarily say that people are always traveling unethically. Um, I, I think that uh, probably people would like to uh, people have a broad range of views about uh, eth ethical uh, tr traveling um but i suppose the one piece of advice is that uh, actually look at what is happening around you don't necessarily um think that what you read in the guidebook is uh, the correct kind of information you look at the actual people and society around you and you think about how your journeys are going to affect them well rather than badly. And I think some of the things that we've talked about in terms of manicure places or um, Alps or Israel, Palestine or whatever are examples of areas that uh, where tourism and pilgrimage uh, actually are not particularly ethically based and I think that it's very important that they should be. And it seems to me that if you actually begin to to know, to try and find out uh, the real knowledge about the places that you're visiting, then that will stand you in good stead. And I can give you one example, which is actually in Jerusalem. Um, there is, uh, just, uh, just uh, next to the walls of Jerusalem, there is a, um, a, an area, a village called Silwan. And this is predominantly a Palestinian village where people have uh, lived for a long time, and which is now subject to uh, daily um, uh, um, uh, vi vi visitations um, and excursions by settlers, and where the whole place has been actually transformed into something called the City of David. And I think that that is unethical in the sense that the people living in this village, this neighborhood, are being subject to very unethical political um, pressures. Uh, and this is something that we should be very careful to avoid. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, talking with us. Um, if, if people want to sort of find out more about your work and, and follow um, your publications, where would be the place to go for that? Uh, the place to go would be the, the School of Oriental African Studies um, uh, website, SOAS website. And uh, we are running a summer school, actually, uh, uh, this summer on uh, tourism and pilgrimage and the cultural industries. Um, and there's all sorts of information there about uh, the kind of stuff that we do as a team. So people are very welcome to, to get in touch with any of us. So now it might be interesting to talk about the perceptions of countries and the sort of stories that we tell about them and how that influences tourism. An example of this is like a country like Egypt. Egypt is somewhere we tend to go to to visit the pyramids. Uh, another example could be the Caribbean. We go to the Caribbean for beaches and sunshine and maybe a bit of rum. <laughs> what happens to the tourism in these countries when things like natural disasters or politics affect the perceptions and the myths that are told around these cultures one uh, interesting example would be to look at egypt as you mentioned egypt has a, a strong narrative of being a place of great historical significance with the pyramids and um, artifacts that has a strong connection with france and the uk and the middle east but as soon as, I guess, the Arab Spring happened, um, there was a great, I guess, plummet in the terms of their tourism. Because obviously no one wants to go to a place where there's uh, an uprising and civil unrest. Uh, but an interesting thing about uh, Egypt is the fact that Egypt is known for its pyramids. But it's funny because there pyramids can be observed around the world. And whilst Egypt probably has the most well-preserved pyramids, there's apparently more pyramids in Sudan. Um, yeah, there's pyramids in Mexico and there's a few mm. scattered around the Middle East itself as well. And it's interesting how, um, I guess, because of the historical narrative and connection that we have to Egypt, that let's say Sudan or Mexico doesn't necessarily have the same narrative and uh, can exploit those aspects of its tourism as as well as Egypt ha can or ha was able to before the Arab Spring. Um, but it is interesting to look at how uh, things that happen in the country uh, politically or, as we said, civil unrest can affect the way that um, the to uh, your tourist industry can suddenly um, disappear or plummet. But then also it's you can look at like the, uh, Cuba as another example in the sense of like, I don't know if it, we're, we're going to be referencing Netflix and podcasts and books throughout this episode. But there's a, a great um, Netflix series called Cuba and the Cameraman. Um, I definitely recommend you guys checking it out. And he goes to explore Cuba over a period of, I think, I think it's about 30 years or something like that, during, um, I guess, the rise of Fidel Castro towards his pretty much to the to his death um and seeing the way how um his i guess political shaping of the country affected the uh people the local people so when um fidel castro first came to prominence uh a lot of people were frustrated that uh, Cuba became like a kind of uh, Ibiza, <laughs> the back place of like people from Florida and the US. So this is like the 1950s. If you want to have a good time, you go to Cuba, you smoke a cigar, you go see flappers and dances and stuff like that. And a lot of people were annoyed by that and they were uh, scared that their culture would be eroded from this type of tourism, even though it was bringing in loads of money. Um, so with the rise of Fidel Castro, he pretty much kind of flipped that on its head and said, no, we're going to um, encourage like different aspects of our um, of our country. We want to have everyone educated, et cetera, et cetera. Not to say Fidel Castro was perfect. There's definitely aspects to <laughs> his leadership that is questionable. Um, but what was interesting was um, towards the last kind of episode of this whole series you see how after the floor the fall of the USSR and um, Cuba had suffered greatly by the fact that they didn't have a, a country that they were dependent on no more um, 
they turn back to tourism. So a lot of these people who were highly educated and skilled under Fidel Castro now was out on the streets selling trinkets and um, doing whatnot to make a living because like they no longer had that kind of source of uh, um, standing in society and it no longer meant anything. Um, so it was quite sad to see him kind of walk through and then, you know, these people were saying, yeah, I used to be an engineer. Or, yeah, yeah, I used to be a doctor. <laughs> but um, what's quite interesting with um, Cuba is throughout all this upheaval up and down, um, it's, it's become a place where people like to go to see 1950s, People say that it's been frozen in time and that um, because of the fact that it it's kept a lot of its cars, the buildings are quite the same from its colonial and, you know, post-colonial era. And so it looks very different from what we would be exposed to, let's say, in the UK or in the US because of the fact that it's frozen in time. So part of its selling point as a tourist is to go and see a relic of an island, which is quite uh, weird how that's become its... Um, uh, I guess selling point or cultural association for mm. tourists now and this is a quite a recent one you know yeah what I found was quite ironic about that was the fact that obviously one of the reasons why those buildings were kind of kept the same was it's quite clear in the documentary that there just wasn't any money to renovate yeah. so when you're going around people's houses people are like look I, I jump over this ditch to get to the uh, the other side of my house because like I can't repair the ceiling. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But like it's almost become like fetishized because mm-hmm. of its sort of like 1950s feel and it's sort of like vintage look and that's really in at the moment. But actually it's come from the fact that after like the US left, you know, poverty really. Mm. Yeah. Have you guys been to Cuba? No, I really want to go. I, no I really want to go. Yeah, because so I was, somebody was recommending me to go to Cuba, and what they said to me was literally, um, "The country is developing now, so if you want to see Cuba the way you imagine, <laughs> go now." Not last long. And, I mean, that just totally highlights this two-sided yeah. situation, right? Yeah. And, um, and this very uncomfortable situation where it's like, like you were saying, fetishization um, of like, yeah, wanting to, I mean, obviously pe- some people want to just get close to the history and that's fine. But yeah, it's it's kind of very inherent in that uncomfortable thing of like exploiting mm. uh, a, a situation that, that, I mean, people suffer for, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, very important aspect that we want to bring in is the topic of, going to resorts yeah Um, so as i mentioned earlier um there's like there's different ways to travel um and tying into what has also been mentioned in terms of the experience of the locals when resorts and hotels are set up compared to those who are traveling to these places so what has been found in places like jamaica and some places in africa as well where certain beaches uh cornered off for hotels um, for these tourists to come and experience Jamaica or all these places which locals can't go to. Um, And so it's, again, tying into the whole segregation of the community and the tourists who go to visit the country, and especially if the community is a big aspect of that country, and yet you are only experiencing them through those who maybe are serving you while you're lying down on there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? It it's it definitely is quite it's quite a different way to experience um, a country. And to do with this kind of resort thing um, is the fact that local communities end up losing access to what is once their space of residence yes. or even like their way of income. Like the fact that, you know, beaches are cordon off for yeah. the, the clients of the resort means that, you know, people can't go to that beach anymore and that, that was your, your home. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I guess that comes down to land and, and the privilege to be able to buy as a hotel and uh, I guess the people that own the hotel to buy off sections of land and be like this is now <laughs> gonna be for this mm. and no one else can take part or be and have a um, connection to that part of the beach mm. it, it's it's sad yeah I, I would say that I think what makes that sort of like resort style of tourism quite you know 
not the best or the most ethical style of tourism. It's just the fact there's a complete divide in terms of who is benefiting from the tourism. Like mm. the local people, if you're in a resort, you're literally like, you know, you're you're by you know you're excluding yourself or you're excluding the local community. The mm. local community doesn't have the chance to to economically or culturally benefit from you being there. Mm. Um, but I'm sure, like, if you using Jamaica as a example, if you think about why people also go to Jamaica, the people mm. are sold as part of the package. Mm. You know what I mean? The food they create, the energy they have, the music they create, that's all part of the package for Jamaica. So it's it's quite sad to feel like that they kind of get excluded. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think in other countries, like say Brazil, when the Olympics went over there, there was like this massive feeling of oh yeah, this is great because, you know, we've always looked to Brazil for like sports and stuff like that. Um, and it could be a massive opportunity for the country to sort of maximise off of that and it to bring in revenue because that's definitely something that the country and a, a wide portion of the community need is money. Mm. Um, but actually what we actually saw happening there is that the government completely went went into the favelas and took people out of their homes, yeah. you know what I mean? Destroyed favelas. It was hugely damaging for the people who actually live in these places, who have regular struggles anyway, do you yeah. know what I mean? And now they have this extra added burden because, yet again, it's the whole fetishization, maybe the whole myth of what Brazil is supposed to be like mm -hmm. in like trying to clean up the favelas and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the community is completely not benefiting at all yeah. from this form of tourism. And I feel like that's, for me, is the worst or the least ethical way to, to travel. But then also to the idea of sanitising or um, cleaning up the image of your country through mm. destroying the community itself yeah, is, is very alarming. Yeah, I was just going to say that it's so interesting that you bring up um, the Olympics into this discussion because um, I think... It, you actually have to take a moment to think about the Olympics being an oppor uh, opportunity for tourism, but of course it is. Like when you think about the Olympics, you're like, oh, there's some kind of like international like relations bridging of cultures and all this kind of stuff. And it's about sports, right? It's all about sports. Except so many people travel to that place in in the in the year of the Olympics, a to like see the sports stars and 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 competitions, mm. but also like for it to be uh, an opportunity to see the country. Um, so it's very closely linked. Um, but yeah, I mean, preparing for the Olympics is, is a whole other thing. That's right? exactly it. Um, yeah. And the question is whether it, the benefit of holding the Olympics and having those tourists come with all the <laughs> good pros and cons of that tourism brings, um, but yet having put in so much to prepare for it, whether it outweighs itself, whether the money you get in is worth everything, especially because I, I, I remember briefly seeing a statistic that said that um, the popularity in terms of tourism of um, Olympics, it ha doesn't hold up to the way it used to back in the day. So that's another question to hold, whether it's valuable to have the Olympics anymore. Okay, so um, like I said before, this this uh, episode has been quite an emotional roller coaster, and, <laughs> and it would be nice to try to end on a bit of a positive note. I guess some reflections around like the the positives, and also some yeah more conscious ways that we can think about traveling because obviously, like we said before, traveling is is a great way of like expanding your uh, worldview, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so yeah, Rona. Take us away. Um, I think using the example of Cuba, you can see how if tourism is executed in the right way, it can be used as a way to rebuild an economy, to provide jobs, uh, well-paying jobs for the, the people and the communities um, who live there. And just from a personal standpoint, I would also say it can be quite humbling to go to another country and to see how things work. Um, because it can be very different mm. to your everyday life. Yeah. Um, I guess for me, like some of the things that I've been thinking about um, 
is one thing is that I have these um, crazy German friends who are amazing um, or like very sporty. I mean, they're like real adventurers and, and yeah, very, very, very fit. And actually, um, like 80% of them, they are never going to fly mm. again. They are going to uh, make that their contribution to reducing um, their carbon footprint mm. on this planet. So wherever they go and do their travels and um, and adventures, they go there by train or they cycle there. Or mm. yeah, and and I, I find that pretty inspiring. Yeah, um, it makes sense um, in the sense of there's. There are positives to traveling, but then there's other there's positive ways to travel as well, um, and that's definitely one thing to explore. Maybe a little bit harder in the UK as we're in Ireland, but we've got the the Eurostar, <laughs> but and coaches, uh, which is yeah it has its perks and and downsides. Um, but and, and what I, another thing that I found quite interesting was the fact that um, a lot of these grassroots communities that are trying to make their voices heard and say hey we don't want this type of tourism or this tourism is affecting our day-to-day -day lives in the community so I think that's definitely um, if we pay more attention mm. to people who are living in these places and saying no we don't want it and, and recognizing that their voices should be heard is definitely a way to move forward. Thanks so much for tuning in to Third Waves. And yeah, we'd like to just say a huge thank you to everyone who gave us advice um, and their thoughts on this topic, um, including Professor Debbie Lyle and Tom Silwyn. Uh, thank you for tuning in to Third Waves and stay tuned online at Third Magazine on Instagram. That's Third with three eyes. I'm Rona. I'm Tribe. I'm Daniela. So I encourage you to go and check out Third Waves on your podcast player right now. As Tribe said, that's T-H-I-I-I-R-D. So three I's in there. If you want to support the making of On the Outside, the show has a Patreon. Head to patreon.com forward slash on the outside podcast and you can become a cheerleader of the show for £4.75 a month. That might seem like a random number, but that is the price of many popular outdoors magazines. So by paying this each month, you are supporting our podcast in a similar way. Thank you all for listening. Stay tuned to this feed. There is going to be some outdoors news coming at